Welcome to Cycling Fashion Week, the only global podcast that looks at cycling purely from an aesthetic and extremely superficial point of view. The podcast is brought to you by Le Club, host to the world's most exciting cycling brands. LeClub.cc is your go-to destination for this season's premium cycling apparel. You can shop brands like Map, The Service Course, Alba Optics, Fingers Crossed, Socks, and they have more brands and categories arriving soon. In fact, they're launching a whole new online experience this spring. They have worldwide shipping, not to mention the finest coffee in the business. Go to leclub.cc and demand more from your cycling experience. I am your host, Alex, and I am joined by my regular co-hosts, Warren and Tony. Guys, how's it going this week? It's going well. I think uh, I think you did a great job on, on the on the read as we're we're getting into it. We love the club, but I've noticed from their Instagram that they post all their posts à la québécois in French and English. So I'm wondering if maybe from now on you should do a uh, do a, a French a French read for our listeners. Maybe we got a few French listeners out there who want to hear what Alex, who is a native French speaker. Uh, that's his first language. Sounds like doing a, an ad read in French. Bienvenue au podcast de Cycling Fashion Week, le meilleur podcast oh, cycliste au monde. Um, so, guys, I hope you had a nice little espresso from your Le Club coffee because we have a monster episode today. We have very special guests on the program. In fact, we are welcoming... Aliyah Barnwell, she is the kit critic for Velo News, the very popular website. She's the kit expert. You can follow her on Instagram at Kit Addiction, where she'll give you her takes on various kits. In fact, she is maybe she is the global cycling style authority. I always say that it's us, but maybe it's her. She's been in the game a little bit longer than we are. Anyway, we're very happy to have her on the podcast and we're also very fortunate to welcome on the same interview alex ostroy he's the founder and owner of the new york city based cycling kid brand ostroy and he'll be telling us about the the kind of the inside baseball of of making kit and we'll be asking him and Aliyah all sorts of questions about kit that we've always wanted to know but we're always too afraid to ask so that's coming later on the podcast. You can also follow Ostroy at Ostroy NYC on Instagram and go to their website at Ostroy.com. Okay, releases. Um, the first element or item that we're going to talk about in the new cycling kit releases is the new Evade Colors, the Evade Collection from one of our favorite brands, Map, out of Australia. So they released that last week it's called the evade collection it's always been known for its lightweight performance and bold graphics so they've got a whole bunch of new colors there they have a green they have a beige they have a light blue they have a sort of burnt orange which uh, appears to be quite trendy in the world of cycling right now many brands are coming out with burnt orange our friends over at albion uh, also have had a burnt orange in their recent releases and they have a pink that looks, I would say, like the, the very famous millennial pink from a few years ago. But what's interesting in that collection as well is the textures. They have textured sleeves on the jerseys. They also released post-ride. They called the post-ride recovery items. So t-shirts, hoodies, crews. Guys, what did you think about the Evade collection from MAP? I love it. I, I think, I mean, I like the design and I also like that I feel like MAP is is going back to what MAP is and, and kind of how I was introduced to them instead of what they sort of did in the last couple of collections, which was kind of follow the Panormal line. When I, my first, what I'll call a sort of boutique cycling uh, company kit was MAP. I know they're not really boutique anymore. They're big, but I many years ago I was in Australia and I was visiting some family and friends and, and riding there and this was still kind of when mostly in Canada you it was pro teams you know your club kit shop kit and stuff and so I I I noticed everyone riding in these like just kind of more outrageous stylish kits never sort of saw it so I went to this bike shop I believe it was called Saint Cloud and in, in Fitzroy maybe in Melbourne 
and I got some map stuff. And not only was it kind of the first foray into a little more stylish, map had done a you know, the, the jersey I got was this contour jersey. It's black with these sort of um, topography lines. It's really nice. But one thing that I loved is they had a lot of little details, little sort of like polka dots and colors in the collar, all these sort of just like little sort of accents to the to the kit that kind of made it feel really unique, even stuff you didn't see all the time. And I feel like they've refined maybe the style from the sort of originals that could seem a little outdated. But if you kind of look at this, there's all these little accents, little bars on the, the back of the jersey, the sort of design looks like, you know, saying map, but it's kind of bigger, like... They've sort of taken their original, what I see was their original ethos. Um, I think people should also go check out the team map, right? They sponsored a, 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 I think it was like a continental Australian team, really wild Jersey. They've taken that and kind of refined it for what the style is right now. And so I just think they've done a great job. I'm glad they kind of went back onto their own own sort of path and 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 if people are kind of jumping away from the the pattern or now leading the pack and i think they've done a really nice job I, i'd wear pretty much all of this and uh even the off bike stuff or the post ride stuff i agree I, I like this fair bit and thought the same thing when i saw it it reminded me of what i originally liked about map i still have a number of map kits from like 2014 2015 that are kind of of that original era where they had the like almost stylized m but it was kind of like almost like a horizon across the jersey and one of the jerseys with the kind of like the big m is almost to me like a more like modern take on that yeah i like the colors i overall just really like it and the other thing i was going to say and this relates back to what i criticized envy for uh, last episode about their soft goods the t-shirts in this map collection are $75. So nice. now we're talking. This isn't winners. If you're going to be buying a, a, a cotton t-shirt that says says a cycling brand on it, you want to be playing premium. Got to keep it expensive or Cycling Fashion Week won't talk about it. Exactly. Otherwise, otherwise, otherwise every episode will be about Pearl Izumi. All right. The next item we're going to talk about is a release from the i believe australian brand and we actually had a discussion about this before should i call it attaque or should i call it attacker because it's australian the only thing is they spell it like the verb to attack attaque in french and since french is a more pro language than english i'm tempted to call it attaque but since they're from australia maybe i'll just call it attacker anyway they why don't, why don't a- we change it and just like all of us even in mine and warren's shitty french we'll call it attaque and just like eventually, even if they as a company, as Aussies want to make an attacker, we're so important in the cycling fashion game that we'll just eventually get everyone, even their staff members, calling it Attaque. So Attaque, so they they released a collaboration with an artist and animator called Will Carsola. He is known for the hit called Mr. Pickles, which is on Adult Swim. And he shares his dark humor and colorful style with a crazy cast of characters to coax out that alter ego. So they say that the collection is for creeps and weirdos, the Hellraisers and Goblins and all of us. Now is your time. So they've released a bunch of jerseys, which they're very kind of cartoonish, but cartoonish in a somewhat, um, how could I say this, in a little bit of a scary sense. Like there's monsters on there. There's characters that look like they're from... Hieronymus Bosch's vision of hell, if you will, but it also has a, a little Ed Hardy side to it. When you look at some of the typefaces and the fonts that are on there, I am somewhat reminded of Rock Racing, which is a personal favorite of mine. So Atake calls this the the artist series, or since it's Atake, I guess I could call it the artiste series. Um, guys, what did you think about this release from uh, Attacker slash Atake? I like it. I, th- I feel like Attacker, or sorry, Attake has had a lot of these artist uh, collabs over the years, and I don't, I haven't liked every single one of them, but they're usually at least different and interesting. And this, for me, at least falls into the interesting category, especially the the Rainbow Goblins one in particular, which kind of looks like what I feel like I would see if I was having like a bad acid trip or something um or a good acid trip or, yeah or a good one and uh it's the kind of jersey i probably wouldn't wear very often i think i would wear it for like 
on special occasions of of some kind. I mean, I think that's the clear statement that needs to be made with these artist series or anything like this that sort of jumps out. It is, and we've made it before. It's not a new new statement for us, but it, it, it you've got to build out your sort of more simple wardrobe before you step into this. But I do love the idea of like a bold wild kit to kind of yeah add add to your repertoire, add to your 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 wardrobe, and sort of certain certain times you're feeling right feeling fast, you know, certain rides, you take it out. Yeah, I think they've done a cool job with this. I've actually only ever seen one of the Attaque artiste series uh, in the wild. I think someone had a, had the, the the Keith Herring kid I saw once riding and it looked really cool. Like he had the matching bibs and everything. And, you know, I think you've got, you, you, you've got to be a, you've got to, you know, you're, it's a bold statement. It's a bold personality. You've got to be confident on your bike. You got to be a pretty good cyclist. But I like that idea that as much as, you know, muted tones and clean lines are sort of timeless. Every once in a while, you step up with something that just like that just like kicks you in the teeth. But if there's any, but if there's any new cyclists listening to Cycling Fashion Week, and I, I certainly hope there are, maybe don't start your wardrobe, your your cycling kit collection with with that. Maybe start with Universal Colors or something a little bit more basic, and then eventually you build up to this. Now. My take on this is I, I always say that I, I want to be bolder in terms of my cycling kit, but anytime I see something that's actually bold, I, I always say, well, I can appreciate this from afar, but I don't need to own it. And this to me is in that category. I don't know if I'm, I'm just too conservative with, with my cycling kit choice. Maybe I just need to take the plunge and, and just do it and, and, and get a crazy kit like that at some point. But it, it feels a little scary to me. A couple of things as well. I actually like that. There's one of the t-shirts that they released. Uh, they called the Brainiac t-shirt. It's basically a white t-shirt with a sort of, you know, skull of, of a monster on it or some sort of goblin ca type character. That character makes me look a little bit like, you know, some of the troll memes that you see on, on Twitter. Like, so you can tell that this is clearly influenced by internet culture, which I, and meme culture, which I kind of appreciated. And the other thing is they have a white jersey that only says attaque on the front but the this is where i was going with the rock racing earlier when you look at the typeface and the font of that attaque logo it, it reminds me a little bit of the rock racing kit so you know what maybe my bold kit this year will be the rock racing kit it's not going to be anything else it's just going to be the rock racing kit and and i'll i'll start there i mean you don't ride in the community i feel like this is kind of one of those like this this type of kit maybe the rock racing is kind of like you're at peak fitness. You both like look good in the kid and you know, you can be on the front for like a good portion. You go to like, I'm sure, you know, every city's got their fast ride. One of them here in Toronto is Hammerfest that, that I used to sort of be able to hold on to. I don't know about anymore, but for a while. And it's like, if you, then you can like kind of pull up, it's like a statement, but you ride on your own. You hate the community. You don't do group rides. It sort of doesn't feel as like, it's not, a, you don't need to peacock the way someone coming to like a fast group ride who like just feels really confident in their ability does. And that's kind of what this is like perfect for, like kind of like showing up. It's almost like, who's that guy? And then you like, you know, you crush it on the front for like 40 K. Now is the community going to like you though, if you show up in that kit? Cause I feel like a lot of the community today in 2022 just rolls to the group ride wearing final mass studios, solid colors. The community wants to blend in. The community wants to not be noticed middle of the pack type stuff. Don't you feel that there's a bit of a risk there that if you wear that kit, the community is going to ostracize you? You're sort of right. But I think the thing is like the community is also, and this, this comes to a question we, we keep dancing around how important is fast to being stylish, but it like, the community also like appreciates a fast person. So like, I'm not saying I'm someone who's fast enough to wear this kit, but like, if you're, if you're like a, just a beast on the bike and you come on there, like, yeah, the community in one way will hate you, but they'll also respect you. I think if you show up at the community ride, the group ride in that kit and you cause a crash, I think you are gone from the community forever. Yeah. If you're, if you're the guy, that guy, that, that guy in the, in the attack, a uh, artist series kit caused the crash because you like, break checked break check because he got to the front of the ride and was afraid then it's panama studios forever at that point and, and nobody's gonna ever wear at that game you might as well just wear a t-shirt on your trainer because if someone sees you on the road you'll be mocked mercilessly anyway so mixed uh mixed takes on the attaque artist series kit all right very quickly another release we're going to talk about so campagnolo 
a favorite brand of Tony when it when it comes to not being actually about the Grupo, Campagnolo released a cycling backpack. So this is full on bike packing, gravelly kind of vibe, but from Campagnolo, a brand that is historically much more associated with European road riding. So they've grown their range of accessories with the addition of a waterproof road bike pack. I don't think it's Gore-Tex, but they say it's waterproof. Uh, the backpack seeks to offer the perfect balance between protection against the elements, advanced functionality, style, and design. It's a Navy backpack. It's got a bunch of ropes uh, or strings on the back. Uh, it's got a bit of a messenger vibe when you look at the shape of the backpack. Um, and yeah, there's not much to it, but it's got a Campagnolo logo on it. Tony, do you love it? I love it. I need it. Uh, I need someone to send it to me because I don't want to pay for it. But uh, actually where I work, my boss is also a cyclist and we've discussed in uh, in the spring doing some lunchtime, uh, lunchtime laps as uh, part of my contract. And uh, that means I'd have to, you know, bring, ride my road bike and, and bring my kit to, to the office. Uh, this would be perfect for me. It'd be perfect to to sort of accessorize uh, when I'm, you know, if I'm in sort of street clothes, but riding the road bike, you know, packing my stuff in there or vice versa. It'd be perfect for me. It looks great. People know I'm I'm a serious road cyclist, uh, but that, that, at that current moment, I've got to commute somewhere. Uh, the look is great. And the Campagnolo logo is quite prominent, uh, you know, not over the top, but you definitely see it well on the back there. So um yeah, if anybody works at Campagnolo, has a Campagnolo connection, hit me up, give it to me. I'll take a lot of pictures of me on it, wearing it. Uh, it's amazing. I totally disagree. I think it looks cheap, doesn't look well made from the photos. The size is weird. I think it'd make your back your back sweat so much if you did like anything above like 10K an hour. The Campagnolo logo is not big enough, in my opinion. <laughs> Uh, to, the food was terrible, but to... the portions are too small. Yeah, exactly. And uh, well, I just you know you're gonna spend all this money on a backpack. Really want to show that logo off. I, I think it looks bad and impractical. I know we don't really care about practicality normally, but what's impractical about it? It's super practical. The size, the how high it is. No, it's good. Think about all the stuff you can fit in there. It's got the roll top. You can fit all your, your, you could fit your Campagnolo mugs, your Campagnolo water bottle, your Campagnolo t-shirts, t-shirts. sweatshirts, my hats, everything about Campagnolo that has nothing to do with the group set or wheels. Uh, is cool. Campagnolo, the group set. Okay, I'm not even gonna joke that it's not cool. It's fucking amazing, but it's cooler to have accessories. It's 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 the guy once I saw on uh on uh what is it on Decarry Boulevard who had a red Honda but had like a bunch of Ferrari stickers on it. So back to the the thing about buying the Porsche hat because you can't afford the Porsche. Um yeah. I'm I'm a no on this Campagnolo backpack, not because it's Campagnolo, not because it's ugly. I'm just a no on backpacks in general, too bike packy, too gravelly, hard no, I, I'm out on, on this one. Uh, okay, last release before we go to the interview with Aaliyah Barnwell and Alex Ostroy, Panormal Studios. Is there an episode when we don't talk about Panormal Studios and what they're releasing? I don't Jesus. think so. It's our duty. We have to keep talking about it. The people demand it. They released a collection in collaboration with Iconic Italian brand Pirelli, the tire makers out of Italy. Essentially, they released a tire set. They're called the Pirelli P0 Race TLR tires. It's one color. It's all black. It does not have tan sidewall, which very controversial on Pirelli and Panama's part. The tires are 75 euros each. And they also, oddly enough, released a, a sort of baseball cap that has a giant Pirelli logo on the front very reminiscent of a potentially a formula one fan type baseball cap. And they also have a t-shirt that goes with it, black t-shirt with a white Pirelli logo. There's a water bottle, there's socks guys. What did you think about that? I don't know. They're tires. I mean, again, you know, I'm an F1 fan and, and everyone, everyone who watched this year knows a lot of people. It's become a big sport knows how well the, the Pirelli tires did with blowout. Max Verstappen is, is never going to ride a bike if he thinks, or he's never going to buy Pat or Mal if he thinks they're connected to Pirelli because he lost out on an easy win because of their tires. So 
Yeah, it's a weird collaboration, and I exclusively ride tan sidewall, so it sort of doesn't matter to me. So interesting that Panama is doing a, a reverse Envy here. So last episode, we talked about how Envy got into the cycling kit game. Envy, very well-respected brand for wheels, for stems, for all kinds of various parts in the cycling industry. Very good at what they do, very well-respected, very expensive products, kind of a flex to own Envy wheels. And then they, can't, they come up with this kind of cheap kit that doesn't look good, that doesn't look like it's well-made. And then Panama Studios, very respected kid brand, very expensive. People want to be seen wearing it in the community on Instagram. And then they come out with a pair of tires in collaboration with Pirelli, and the tires don't even have tan sidewall. I just, why is there a need for, for Panama tires here? Aren't we just happy with Panama kit? I, I don't really get it, and I, I don't find the clothing to be that nice personally why would you want to wear a panama t-shirt that has a giant pirelli logo on it i'm relatively unclear on this i get that it's a it's kind of a vintage iconic italian brand that that has a history there but i just don't really see you know why there was a need for that and you know who who basically asked for that they just slapped their name on it like there's no design touch or anything done to do to the tire to make it like somewhat unique it's just it's just their logo so i don't know you're looking at it from the wrong angle this isn't pat normal coming to pirelli this is pirelli coming to pat normal right like think of you i mean alex again you don't do the community but think of your friends in the community do you know a single person riding pirelli tires no i haven't seen a pirelli tire on a road bike I don't I don't even know when. I I've, I've never owned them. I don't I can't think of a single person I know owns them. I can't think of shops who at least display them prominently like they're obviously around. This was Pat Ormal, or this was Pirelli realizing they are failing in market share. Nobody gives a shit about them as a as a as a bike tire and they know that Pat Ormal is is at the uh, although possibly jump, you know, cargoing the bib, but like we never even thought of talking about Pirelli. We haven't talked about much about tires in general, but like Pirelli probably wouldn't have come up if we had a tire segment. But now we've just done 10 minutes on Pirelli, essentially. So this was this is Pat or this is Pirelli coming to Pat Ormal and saying, we need, we need some, we need this is, you know, we need a makeover. We need some zhuzh from the the the, the cool kids. This is this is she's all that. I don't know. I think I'm a no on this release from Pan Alma. Yeah. I, and for the record, I like Pan Alma. Kind of basic, kind of all over the place, but I like it. It's well made. It's good design overall. I, I just can't believe they didn't do tan sidewall. Like I, I'm pretty sure if you look at every photo. On Panorama's Instagram, the riders have tan sidewalls. Or is is Panorama kind of sending us a message that black is the new tan sidewall? I don't agree. No, they're wrong. Okay, for our next segment, we have this week a very special interview with two distinguished guests we have on the program today, Alia Barnwell and Alex Ostroy. Alia is the kit critic for Velo News, and Alex is the founder of the kit brand Ostroy, and for, which is from New York City. Both are from New York City. I believe they're currently somewhere warm riding. I'm not going to say where they are. And one thing is we often say on this podcast that we are the global style authority when it comes to cycling kit. And I think that's probably an accurate depiction of the podcast, but to be perfectly honest, Alia is probably the global style authority and has been the global style authority for longer than us. You can find Alia on Instagram at kit addiction, and she writes a column on cycling style in Velo News. So we're very happy to have Alia and Alex as the owner and founder of a kit brand on the program today. So Aliyah and Alex, thank you very much for uh, coming on Cycling Fashion Week. Thank you for having us. Lay it on thicker, guys. I love it. But um, I, I, I think uh, I'm, I am would love to claim the, the, you know, title of the greatest kick critic or whatever, the style authority. But um, I think um, being critical means that you kind of can't just base it on style. But that's why I want to come here because I'm learning so much from you guys. You guys convinced me to um, chop some steer or two off. So. so you are both New Yorkers. I am from a smaller city. I'm from Montreal, as you know, and I've always been curious. I've been going to New York a lot. Just you know, one thing we do in Montreal, we tend to go to New York just for a weekend in, in the spring. 
and I've always wondered what wondered what's New York like for riding overall. It seems like maybe a city where there's a lot of gridlock, a lot of traffic, a lot of cars. What what's New York like for riding? It's actually I've come to I moved there after college, so I'm not born native like Aaliyah, but I've grown to to love it. It's not I wouldn't say it's world class cycling. It doesn't have the Alps, but it does have some some pretty great attractions first one being the parks which are nearby to most accessible to most new yorkers you can easily ride to them and race in them so you can get a game of pickup cycling pretty much any time of the day which is which is different than anywhere else i've ever been you can go and find some people that are that are riding at about the speed that you want to go at and if you're a regular you can make friends just like a pickup game of basketball and go and get a good ride in. So that's unique. And then we have a nice route to the George Washington Bridge, um, which does lead to some better riding. It's about, if you're in Brooklyn, it takes it's about- fi- It's 15 miles. Yeah. Seven, I don't know how many kilometers that is, but it's, it's 15 to 17 miles from Brooklyn up and over the bridge. Also in the season, you can actually ride your bike to races five days a week. You don't have to get in the car. They're reasonably priced. So th- those are the pros. We also have a casino track. I mean, you know, for, right. for those other disciplines that we won't discuss. <laughs> so my only experience of New York cycling is Central Park in Zwift. Um, what would you say the level of cycling style in New York City? I mean, New York's obviously one of the fashion capitals of the world. What's the... What's the state of, of New York cycling style that you see on the roads? I think it's pretty high. It's obviously it's a place where there's plenty of money to be spent and um, style is as a premium. So you definitely see a lot of honor mall. Osteray has a foothold here. We are pretty like loyal to our brand. So Osteray has been supportive of the community. So he has a team, you know. So things like that, we, we tend to like a little clannish. We wear, uh, we wear the people we know. Um, because you probably actually know somebody who has a brand. So you definitely see some folks that look really, really great. And then you see, I mean, I hate to be that snob. I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and do it. You kind of are judging a little bit based on what people are wearing, whether you hop on that wheel. And you can, like, I happen to be wearing a black kit right now. And somebody thought I was in Good Guys. <laughs> just because I happen to be wearing a black kit. And they're not going to move. Black, good Guys is a, a team, a New York team, a New York team that just wears black all the time. Um, so yeah, you're judged by your kid as you would be anywhere else. I think. So you say there's, there's a lot of money in New York and that leads to, you know, sometimes the purchasing of good kit. Are there a lot of dentists in New York oh, as well? Yes. So many, so many cervellos just, just running for. Are, are the, de- are the dentists also, are they on the, uh, Assos train? Is it the Cervello Assos collaboration for most of the dentists? I, yeah, I think. We know our friend who at Strictly Bicycles, which is probably the foremost shop for high for very expensive bikes, and he does a great job uh, courting and selling to people to wealthier New Yorkers. And it's it's actually a part uh, Asos in the one in the city owns part of the stores, so they they know that, and they're, they're, they have a big presence there. <laughs> so we've had uh, we've had a couple questions, and we've been staunch about um, mix. We, we're pro mixing and matching brands. We think that it actually really shows that you have sort of style beyond just going through a lookbook and, and choosing. And so I know, obviously, Alex, you own a company, and and you know you're going to be loyal to that. But what do you guys think about mixing and matching brands in New York, which is really a, a in its fashion is really a peacocking type of fashion town, like outside of cycling. Is that something you see with the cyclists around? Like they're, they're, they're really trying to do something different and new by, by grabbing, you know, a piece of map, a piece of Australia, a piece of Panama and kind of fit it all together. Or people just kind of wear the one brand uniform. I agree with you. I think it involves a higher degree of difficulty for style because you can fail terribly at it if you do it improperly. And that's why, it would be like the opposite of getting, you know, a, a Asos or a Rafa black kit, because that's more about not failing than it is about succeeding style wise to me. And, but if you, if it's done right and it's difficult, I even think you can mix different pro teams 
bibs and jerseys. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, this might be the hottest take that's ever been <laughs> right? dropped on this podcast. And I'm going to say that this is no small feat because we just keep dishing out hot takes on this podcast. But this is a whole new level, mixing different pro teams. So I'm not even sure if I'm in favor of wearing pro team jersey to begin with unless you ride for that team but mixing pro teams is a whole new level of uh aggressiveness that's just alex i do not speak for i, I do not agree with that. the old school people who have put in a lot of work and leg time on the bike they can kind of get away with this kind of stuff uh, i think that it does speak to a little bit of tryhardism when you see the guy that's wearing the matchy matchy brand new rocket kit like you haven't you're you're not taking risks I'm just going, I'm just, I'm naming the extreme poles here. I'm saying it's not impossible. Maybe it is, you know, for you guys, but we know people who can pull this off. Yeah, I think it's, you're right. It's not impossible, but it's also very hard. Even if you do it well, I think it would be hard to do it and not look like you went to Goodwill (laughs) and picked up some cycling kit, but kind of in a cool, inventive way. Like it, there's an element of, of hipsterness about mixing vintage pro kit that I'm not sure I would want to step into, but I agree that if you do it well, it can be very interesting overall. Based on his references, there's like one guy that I know that's (laughs) it. He knows, he claims and claims there's other people. There's one dude, that's it. That can pull that off with the mixing of teams. That is, I will not, I do not co-sign that. Sorry, no. We can mix other brands. I feel like, um, again, it is a challenge to mix brands and it's not always a win. But that just shows that there's a little bit of, of, uh, of trying. You're making an attempt to do something interesting. You got to break the rules sometimes. Otherwise, you never move forward in fashion. Since we have Alex, who owns Ostroy, by the way, go follow Ostroy on Instagram at Ostroy NYC. And Aliyah, who is the really the global style authority, the kit critic for, for Velo News. We thought that what we would do for this interview is we would poll our listeners and essentially ask them, to ask the questions that they've always wanted to ask about Kit, but that they were somehow too afraid to ask. Since we have two authorities on the podcast today, we thought that they were really the people to go to to ask this sort of everything you've always wanted to know about Kit, but were afraid to ask. And we got a bunch of questions from our listeners that we will run by you today to hear your, uh, sometimes they're takes, but sometimes they're just factual pieces of knowledge about Kit that people didn't necessarily have and that they felt they wanted to ask you. Some of them could also be totally made up too, if that's okay. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, but we actually got enough real ones that we won't need to. I make. mean, the answers, not the questions. Oh, the, the answers. Oh, the answers. Okay. Well, that's. You well, we, you we won't know. So. Yeah, we're exactly. Say um, it with confidence. Okay. So I'll start with the first question we got, which is more of a, more of a factual um question that that actually comes up quite a bit when when people talk about kit and the question we got was from a listener asking if it's true that most brands sort of most high-end brands are really all made in the same five or six factories in in northern italy is there any truth to that or is the production of cycling kit a little bit more um, diversified than those five or six factories well, right next to the giant bike factory, actually, there's a big kit factory that makes all the brands, like Giant makes all the different bike brands. That's not true, of course, but there, I would say there are about 10 factories that make roughly 80% of the kits outside of China. Italy is getting less and less of them because it's harder and harder to find sewers in Italy. And now even in Eastern Europe, it's difficult to find sewers. So even most of the, very few of the Italian brands are even made in Italy. I know for us, we have two main factories. One big factory that I would say it's, I would estimate is the the fifth biggest factory in the world. And we're one of about 20 brands that produce there. And that offers us several advantages that you'd imagine that the expertise and you know, different people are trying to solve the same kinds of problems. They've solved them many times. They have many, many, you know, uh, individual departments where we can get very specific advice. And then we, for us, we have one very small family owned factory in Tuscany that we actually 
do most of our work in, they pay much more individual attention to us. We go there every year for weeks and we spend time with them developing products. I mean, they, they won't even let us eat breakfast alone. You know, they, they're very <laughs> hospitable. We spend all day with them and we can prototype a new, say, bib every day uh, from scratch, ride it and tear it down, make another one tomorrow. We couldn't do that in a big factory. It's just not flexible enough, especially for a smaller brand like us. And of course, most of the uh, bigger factories, the food is nowhere near as good as Tuscan. So. And so you said, you said it's getting harder to find sewers in Italy and, and that it's as a result, the, the factories are, are kind of gradually migrating out of Italy. Like where is that, that expertise and that know-how going geographically in the world? Because obviously China probably makes a fair bit of kit. Northern Italy was making the high-end kit. Where is it happening now mostly? Less and less, like I said, less and less is actually made in Italy. If you can set up a good factory all over the world, second and third world countries, there are good factories. And it's great to provide jobs for a lot of these peoples and places outside of Italy. Um, okay, another question we got from one of our listeners. Uh, this one is, uh, I don't know. Uh, I'll, I'll let you answer that one. Why does the cycling industry hate tall, skinny riders? So that person saying a sub 19 BMI and six foot five, nothing fits. So I'm not sure if that that's a flex or a question, but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll ask you that the question. I, so, sorry to jump in because obviously I'm not the pro to answers, but it, it, you know, doesn't the whole world hate that in a sense? Because it's just such an atypical body type that. It's, it would be, you know, it's very specific. If it's a very specific, I have it. You don't meet many people with a sub 19 BMI that's six foot five. So where, where does Chris Froome buy kids? <laughs> but I don't think he's that tall. I don't think Chris Froome's up there. Yeah, he's, he's like, like six, six two and a half. Yeah, he's like six two or six three. Um, I'm definitely falling into that camp of longer limb proportionately. Uh, so I get this person's problem, but they don't hate us. It's just, you know, it's a business and you have to kind of hit that medium, right? You want to hit the most people. You want to find the kit that's going to fit the most people. But unfortunately, as the trend towards shorts being a little bit shorter or like that mid-length short um, kind of takes over, uh, you're going to see a little bit more problems for people who are small and skinny like me. It's going to look a little weird. Um, you're just gonna have to find that, that's kind of the thing about style and what makes this kind of interesting, right? You have to find a brand that not only visually is appealing or like has a stylistic elements that are appealing, but actually fits you well. Oh yeah. You say you have long limbs. So one of the trends that we've been seeing, um, in the, in the kit industry over the last few years is Jersey sleeves to the elbow. So the kind of almost three quarter length Jersey sleeves for short sleeve jerseys. As a long limbed person, can you actually achieve that, or do the sleeves always end up sort of mid bicep territory? I mean, I'm literally looking at the sleeve right now. I feel like it's a little bit shorter than it was normally. But I'm wearing an extra small of this jersey, and it's always going to be a little shorter than it would be on most people who wear an extra, on most women who wear an extra small. Um, that said, that's why I prefer a longer sleeve. It's it's not just that; it's the function behind it, right? Like a longer sleeve has some functional. Uh, benefits it, and flattering and generally it looks more flattering and rather than cutting in the middle of the bicep and you can tuck the arm warmers in so you get that horrible arm warmer gap if you are one of those people who wears arm warmers i cannot stand that gap it's just visually in every way are there people who don't wear arm warmers i mean i prefer a long sleeve i have to have a whole piece about this later in the year i'm like i really prefer a long sleeve jersey if you can make a long sleeve jersey work then and like it's correctly it's like the correct weight so you're not sweaty um, then yeah, long sleeve. We, we know we don't like the lump the under that lump in between where the alarm warmer ends. Oh my God. And no, they use a lot of beliefs just don't get that right. They still haven't quite figured out the topping of that, that gripper for the arm warmer needs to be flat. I agree. There's a lot of, there's a lot of issue there, but for, for me, I just find, I don't know. And I assume New York's weather would be very similar to Toronto's in the sense that if you're kind of going for a spring, fall morning ride and you're leaving at seven and it's a 150 K or 60 something miles. I don't know. You're, you're, you've got to come off, right? Like that's the thing, the arm warmer, I completely agree. I, I much prefer the style and the comfort of a, a long sleeve, but I just, I just find that with the weather in sort of Eastern Canada, United States, 7 a.m. is two degrees and 10, 10 a.m. is 14 degrees. Uh, again, I don't know if that is a Fahrenheit. You're gonna... There is a significant change in temperature. And I think that's the trick to having like a comfortable jersey. And that's where it vests. Vests and base layers come into play. I personally yeah. 
Um, and as I realize that this is not for everyone, I will open a jersey. I would rather have an open long sleeve jersey with a base layer under it or a bibs or a bra that is like kind of like a chest plate basically, um, than have an arm warmer that is with a gap. I can't, you know what I mean? I was just never, it's quite right. Unzip jersey when you're climbing is actually super pro. That's a that's a very pro look. I'm I'm in favor of that. By the way, subtle flex by Tony here, talking about his casual midweek 150 kilometer <laughs> ride. Just the dude is just he's just having coffee and then heading out for a 150 kilometer ride on a Wednesday. He wants to know what to wear. Uh, so yeah, nice, nice flex by Tony there. Well, I I but I'll, I'll give you, what's a, what's the opposite of a flex? A self burn where I, I I don't know if people want to see me with my shirt unzipped. That's what base layers are for. It adds another layer of color and variety, and it's kind of something to reveal or not reveal. I do love a base layer. I think that, well, that'll have to be a segment coming up in the future because I, I love a base layer. Okay, next question. This one is more of a take, and our podcast actually has some history with that question. So someone asked if people wearing their socks on top of their tights <laughs> or their leg warmers, 1980s roller disco style, is this acceptable? So we have a guest host on this podcast who is who is here occasionally. Um, his name is Italian Alex. So it's another Alex, except this one's Italian. He believes that wearing the socks under the tights or the leg warmers is outdated boomer style and that the younger generation, Gen Z, they all wear their socks above their tights. So I'm not a boomer, but I'm also not Gen Z. I'm a millennial. Anyway, I have my take on this. I won't say what it is. What do you guys think about that? I, I know that this is directed at me, so I'm going to field this one. I am, I, obviously, you're going to come, you're coming right from my neck. That's fine. Just, um, honestly, this was a recent discovery. I have struggled kind of back and forth with this. I'm not a leg, I like leg warmers. They serve a function, but like, we're, we had two different conversations here. The question is, do you wear socks over a leg warmer or is your socks over tights? Tights, if I- Let's wear, say over tights, over tights. I, okay, I see that written here. So if it's tights, I'm wearing a shoe cover. <laughs> so this is a negated, this is, this is negated. You're not gonna see my, if it's a tight, then if it's cold enough for me to put on full tights, then I'm wearing shoes, covers, or a sock, an oversock. I love a good oversock. I'm trying to find more obnoxious oversocks so I can trigger more people. But I do not think my socks are gonna be visible. Now, if it's a leg warmer, then it's underneath. Why? Because the leg warmer has to come off. That's the point of a leg warmer. Otherwise, why don't you just put on tights? <laughs> so there's a functionality issue here. So if it's, and I, but I cannot stand that gap between tight and or leg warmer and shoe. And I've come to understand that like, it's kind of like the cycling style varies by area. And that's, you can kind of tell where somebody comes from. Apparently people don't like double zippers in Belgium. Who knew? These people, I don't know these people. I can't claim these people, but apparently that's the thing. Functionality, it makes perfect sense. Like I couldn't, I wouldn't want to get a jacket that didn't have a double zipper, but that's, I digress. If we're getting into knee warmer or knicker, I like any excuse to wear an oversock. So I will probably put on an oversock anyway, and just maybe have a little line of sock just to kind of like accent whatever my outfit is, but it could be more than like an inch of sock above, above the, uh, the oversock. Um, if we're into neoprene booties, I, that needs to be covered. It needs to be tight into neoprene, Pre preferably. I have broken that rule a couple of times, with an added like, but it's like over, then it's really cold. It's like tights, over sock, neoprene booty over that. So when we talk about neoprene booties, are we talking about spats here? Uh, I would, honestly, I love a spat. I don't have a pair of like $200 spats yet. Oh. I am pro spats. I am the one pro I don't, spats person. I don't like on the design, podcast. but I understand the function of them. They need to up that design. Looks like, I don't even know what it looks like. Looks like modern. <laughs> At armor. That point, it looks like should, rock, rock racing. At that point, you get boost. Ew. Yes. Ew. No. Um, okay, but rock racing is amazing. Like we can't go, we can't, we can't conflate the two because rock racing is amazing. And we've first already of all, you guys need to do a podcast on rock racing. Specifically on rock racing. No one has really done the competitive history of the team, which is totally fascinating. Oh, they're insane. I mean, I remember they were very popular when I started about cycling about 15 years ago and it was, that was kind of when it came out, but we've, we've already agreed that to our listeners that we're going to, we, we put up a poll, we're going to buy a rock racing kit because they actually sell the vintage the like 2007 era rock racing kits on their website. And I, if I can get fit enough, I'm going to race our sort of local crit in a rock racing you guys, kit. You guys should this, have uh, uh, Bobby Endo on the show. The Endo Customs, uh, do they make rock racing kits? Bobby Endo was the designer. And I remember when they were, as soon as they put out that rock's not dead kit, my first thought was, 
somebody's going to end up with those machines. And I was trying to, I was like, I want them. <laughs> and he was, you know, he was the guy doing them. So that's how he started, you know, he got them. I did not know that. Alex has no. a lot of good stories. You, you got to, he's going to be back on the show. I swear to God, he's got some good ones. Um, okay, moving on to the next question. So this is another long standing debate. So either, you know, Alex or, or Leah, you take this one. How risky are white bibs? Because they are a look, but I'm also terrified of them. So that question from one of our listeners, how risky are white bibs? This is a good question. Um, in theory, it's a great idea. And it can look great when you see it on the world champion. But it ha one, it has to be correctly made. It has to have two layers of panels. And even then, all it takes is a little bit of moisture or a less than stellar washing. And the person behind you will quickly become your proctologist, basically. I, the biggest problem with bibs, I think people think that the wear is because, oh, I've had this bib, I've ridden 10,000 miles in them. And in the industry, they call it grin. And what grin is, which is especially bad with white bibs, is if you take a fabric and you pull it apart and stretch it, right? For example, if it is printed and not dyed, so if one side is black and the inside is white, you can see the white coming through. What makes that kind of become exposed and unravel and the fabric become thinner is really the washing, not the riding, not the sun. People put it with enzyme detergent like Tide and that will quickly destroy, you know, if it, a white bib, you would have to really very carefully hand wash every time. I, that was going to be my next question, Alex. How do you recommend you know, kit care to make sure it lasts long. Cause as you said, the, it's the washing that destroys a kit and not the wearing. That's the, that's the first rule. I think I turn them inside out, put them in a kit bag. And then the most uh, important thing is again, don't use a, a regular laundry detergent. Obviously don't put them in hot water, hang them to dry. Vinegar actually works really well. That's what they used to do. It still works well. Any enzyme free detergent will also work. So just back on the white bibs, Alex, as a, as a brand owner, is there enough of a market out there for white bibs for brands like yours to actually bother to make them or are white bibs really something that are reserved for, you know, FDJ or, uh, you know, world champions? We would absolutely, we've looked into, we have yellow bibs right now, curry bibs which we haven't had a problem with. We looked at it very closely. I would look at it, but you know, it would have to be, I've definitely seen some fails and you know, we don't want to do that. It's a flex. It's a huge flex. Like we're very pro them on this podcast. Yeah. We think that it should be mandatory for the world champion every year that the world champion comes out that doesn't have white. So Alaphilippe the last two years has, has done black and it's been very upsetting. <laughs> but there is exactly what you're saying. There is that understanding as a sort of recreational cyclist, you know, to what extent can you do white bibs? And it is really hard, especially in climates like New York, Toronto, and Montreal. Uh, sorry, everyone, for our North American bias. But in those places where you're going to have a lot of, of, you know, rain and dirty, dirty roads, even if it seemed like it was a clean day because it's a, they're, they're busy metropolises and stuff. So as a whole, I love white bibs. I, I agree. I don't think I could wear one. I don't think I could own one personally. I just, I just thing is bibs are a big investment. So if you're going to wear them twice and they're ruined, it's, I understand why people aren't really out there buying white bibs all the time. You need a new pair every ride is the answer. Okay. Moving on to the next question. So this is more of a, of a fit question. How do I know if my kit is too tight? If I'm between sizes, should I go up? Should I size up or should I size down? Hi, how tight is too tight, really? Um, I think Alex wanted to field this one, but I'm going to start. Yeah, I'm going to kick, kick it off. Personally, I, I prefer a tight kit. Like I said, I like, like, I like tight clothes. Um, it is, we are going for an aerodynamic uh, benefit here. There is a fluid dynamics at play. It makes everyone look better. makes you feel better. Impressive, blah, blah, blah. How do you know if it's too tight? If that zipper is rippling. If its zipper is rippling or it's cutting into your hip, like if it's a bib and it's cutting right into your hip when you fold your legs, that personally, I think that's a little bit too tight. Alex says if you, can zip, if you can't zip it up, if it starts to struggle, if, it, if you start to struggle at the chest, 
Um, and then I think he's going to say that that's too tight. That's a little bit too tight for me personally, because you can still zip something, struggle, zip it all the way up, and then you get those unsightly ripples across the down the zipper, where it's just like a little, the zipper's like holding on for dear life. It shouldn't look like that. But are you like sucking it in? Like I have to suck in my gut on some of my jerseys to like get the zipper up. But then if I let it go, it's, it's still, uh, you know, it's, it still works. So is that too tight? <laughs> you're scratching your head like you're having doubts. So, I mean, all, like I said, if you can get it up, and again, this zipper is not rippling and forming like a river or like a undulating line going down your chest, then it's good. Warren, that's what a tight base layer is for to to kind of jam everything in before you put exactly. it on your kit. It's like, what's that brand called? Uh, Spanx, I think, or? Yeah, Shapewear. You get the tight, You get like like Elise said, you get an, an extra choice for your colors. So you can add a little more panache to it. Then it gets tight, then you get the bibs over top of that. And if your gut isn't sucked in from there, that jersey is way too tight. If you're still having to breathe in after having a tight base layer and your bibs over top, I think it's too tight. Speaking, speaking from the industry side, not just my brand, I'm pretty sure everybody has the same issue. And that is, especially with newer cyclists, they don't understand oftentimes what a jersey is supposed to fit like. They think it's supposed to fit like a t-shirt. So we often get jerseys returned to us saying things like, is this meant for children? Are you kidding me? <laughs> so sometimes we'll ask them to send us a picture and very, you know, most of the time it actually fits them quite well. And they're, and if you can explain that to them, most, you know, also most of the time they'll, they'll listen to that and they'll, they'll start wearing them like that. But it, it takes a little bit of education for a newer cyclist. Maybe they think it should fit like a t-shirt because they come from the gravel world. Bazing. Or they're coming from, remember older jerseys have that long, sad thing, you know. Right. Really I was going to, I was going to say, you know, I have a, I have a lot of vintage jerseys. And if you look at jerseys from 40 years ago to 20 years ago, they got a lot smaller and lighter. I mean, it's just sort of the trajectory is pretty clear. They're getting smaller and lighter and stretchier. So the same size jersey, you know, I have I have uh, uh, jerseys for uh, Greg LeMond in the same size, some of his original wool jerseys. They're huge. I mean, they were small at the time, but they're huge. So anyway, it's it's much bigger, thicker, and heavier. You would look at that now, and you would think, how do people even wear this? Hmm. And then you look at the wool stuff, and of course, you know, it's far less breathable, but it's also much bigger. So it just it's it's a different. You have to kind of wrap your head if you're a newer cyclist around the way that it's supposed to. Fit. Okay, next question. This is actually a fascinating one. And I think, Alex, you're going to be able to enlighten our listeners on this one. So one of our listeners asked, can we talk about pricing? How do brands get away with it? In very few other sports, do you see $300 plus shorts? We're talking US dollars here. So in Canadian dollar terms, that's maybe like a thousand bucks. Um, what, Alex, talk to us about pricing. Like, How do brands get away with it? How do, how do brands justify it? Actually, I don't think the margins on bibs, for example, on for most brands, most of the time are any different than greater fashion or any other sport. Bibs are just very expensive to make. They're, they're difficult to sew. They require special machines and special training. Even expert seamstresses can't sew bibs. They have to be trained how to do it. The chamois and trim pieces like the straps and cuffs are, are very expensive. And, you know, it's not like uh, uh, the designers, like we're not making them or even the factories aren't making them. They're buying them from other suppliers. So there's a markup there. So I don't think the mark, at least for us, and maybe we're doing it wrong, but our margins really are, are not that good on bibs. And I would say that's probably true for, for most brands. Now, there are designer brands in cycling just like there are $500 t-shirts where maybe a lot of that money is going to marketing and supporting the brand and, you know, uh, Calvin Klein's the horses and stable and, you know, they need a lot more money to keep all that going. That's a different thing. But I would say even up to $250, $300 that the margins are actually similar to other product, uh, other clothes and just other products you'll see in stores. It's really pretty much the same. So it's just an expensive product to make. There's yeah. just a lot of labor, a lot of time that goes into it. Yeah. 
I mean, I look at, you know, I was uh, look at a pair of basketball shorts from um, Nike for $60. I bet they make those in China for $3. That's a way better margin. Next question. Someone asks shorts or bibs for women. Bibs are impractical. Are shorts cool looking enough? If you have the right shorts, you can make them look like they're bibs. Bibs are not impractical. You guess I'm obsessed with the drop tail bibs. That's kind of another reason I started doing this the same. Yeah, best of both worlds. You need the best of both worlds. That said, there are some drop tail bibs with are too low in the back, so I'm kind of embarking on this massive quest to like search down hungry drop tail bibs. I have a massive Excel file that has like 30 bibs on them. Um, that said, I get why women are concerned. It kind of sucks that they're like a lot of people are like resistant. A lot of women in particular are resistant to bibs, even though they are structurally generally better. It's easier to get a good pair of bibs that stays in place than a good pair of shorts that stays in place. That we find that to be true, and we try to convert women and beginning men to bibs for sure. Mm -hmm. And honestly, shaping is going to like negate anything. So if you buy a pair of shorts and they move all over the place and you shape, now you're not riding. So get the bibs, even if you have to struggle out of them in the bathroom. Um, that said, there are so many more options now. I can name like if I were to get out my phone right now, I could whip out to 25 bibs easily that were that are drop tail from a, a range of companies. Athos is coming out with one even. Asos has them, Rapa has them, like, you know, there are options if you want to, if you're looking for something that you can get out of. Should we be looking forward to a, a Kit Critic uh, Velo News article on drop tail bibs uh, coming up? Is that, is that maybe something? Yeah. Okay, another question we got, speaking of bibs, how do you fold and store your bibs? Or actually, maybe you don't fold them, maybe you hang them. What's the what's the best way to do that? <laughs> I'm going to build this one. So I'm going to make fun of Alex for this. I mean, being, this is his job. For us, both of us, it's jobs. I will hang up my nice ones. I start out hanging them and, oh, you get your pair, you know, the matching kits so that you hang the kits together on a hanger. Now I'm just like, one hanger has like 40 bibs. <laughs> I have like a ton of bibs on one hanger and like the rejected or like ones that don't come in a pair are now in a bin. Alex basically gets his and like wears them once and wipes his nose with them and throws them in the garbage. Like he doesn't, you know what I mean? Like he doesn't even, it's not even a thing. But from, I guess if you wanted to actually store things nicely without stretching out the strap, there is a method where you like turn them inside out and you fold one through a leg. It's kind of hard to describe it without uh, visualization. Unfortunately, I'm sorry, our camera is off. Um, but yeah, you, there are ways to fold them if you must. But I think the point about like a cycling kit is it doesn't really, if it's tight enough, it won't show wrinkles. So you just throw it in the bin and not stress yourself out and just collapse after you've done your whatever 150 mile or 150 kilometer weekday ride. Um, you just come home, wash it and, and dry it and throw it in the bin. So I have a take on this. I think the idea of hanging your nice bibs hopefully in a beautiful corner of your apartment. It's almost like an art exhibition. You've got your expensive bibs there. They're you know all parallel, all nicely spaced out, same amount of space between them. I think it's a very nice idea in theory, but I think for most people in practice, that doesn't work. I have an 18 month old daughter. I've got toys all over the apartment. All the storage is taken by either my daughter, my wife, or just practical stuff in general. So the idea of hanging bibs, I don't think it's possible. I have over the years migrated to the Marie Kondo Japanese rolling technique where I have a drawer full of bibs. And what I do is I fold them in two vertically and then I roll them tightly packed like a little sausage showing just the brand on top. Because if you've got like seven pairs of white bibs, uh, sorry, of no, seven pairs of white bibs, that's certainly not realistic, but seven pairs of black bibs, and you don't know which ones are your maps, which ones are your Ostroys, which ones are your Panorama Studios. So you just put the logo on top so you know what you're grabbing in the morning. Is this, does that work or am I going to ruin my bibs by doing that? I, my first, you heard my reaction, I'm sure, is the folding of the chamois made me a little nervous, but there is, I think that works. I mean, whatever works for you, if you're not feeling the results from the chamois being a little weird. You're, you're just bragging. <laughs> <That's the question. laughs>
Um, although that is a legitimate question for most people, especially in New York, where space is at a premium. That's how bibs are expensive. I don't know how many people are going to be like, I have so many bibs. Where do I put them all? Yeah. I think with the Instagram image that we see of people in their beautiful closets with the organized, you know, hanging, Erin, yeah, I guess, has like the organized closet with all their nice kids hanging beautifully behind them. That is yeah, some Instagram. You, you could ask my wife about uh, my storage of bibs. I'm sure she would have, she would have a lot to say about that. Okay. All right. So one thing we do with all of our guests on the podcast is we wrap up the interview with some rapid fire questions. So a very simple concept. We just give you kind of two choices. You tell us which one you would pick and why, and, you know, feel free to both answer those questions as well. So the first one I'm going to ask you is New York city or Los Angeles, summer, fall, New York, spring and winter, LA. Spring in spring in New York is like Indian winter. It's still just freaking too cold yeah. for, for summer. Isn't summer in New York kind of heavy and humid and a bit gross? It's not worse than LA. I mean, you you want humidity or you want heat. I I don't mind either one of them. I still prefer a hot summer day to a cold New York winter day. It's not even close. New York has on, everything's on and popping in the summer. I wouldn't give up a New York summer. And then you can always just leave. There's plenty of places that are shaded. By the time we're riding, we've been, like we said, um, we've adopted New Jersey and Saramont. Oh, that's coming up. Um, but we we ride where there's shade. Is <laughs> the moral of the story in the summer. And do you guys ride outside in winter in New York, or is it too cold for that? A lot of people, a lot of the serious cyclists do, for sure. Um, Zwift has affected that I've seen over the years, it's become less popular to ride outside, but you still get cabin fever, fever after a while. So it, it is nice, especially you go to the park. If it's not too, too cold and you see your friends, it is a nice break from being inside and it's beautiful there in the winter. It's, you know, it's different. So it, it's, it's novel. I like to ride outside. Agreed. Then you get to try out, you have your layers and your winter clothes. You don't get to wear the winter clothes if you stay in Zwift all the time. Okay. Best borough in New York City for riding bikes. So what Aaliyah was uh, alluding to is New York cyclists have kind of effectively annexed New Jersey and the New York towns of Piermont and Nyack, which are right over the GW bridge. So cycling in New York, most people are accessible to the Hudson River bike path and that takes us straight to the GW and then we're in you know uh, better roads for cycling there's a river road that's beautiful and it gets hillier so that's really the best but otherwise as we mentioned before both Central and Prospect Park are are really kind of special in, in New York City for cycling for providing a sense of community and places to race so they race people will race at like six in the morning or whatever and then they'll go over the bridge um, but we also have casino, like, I, you know, we're, this is road, we're specifically roadies, so we're sticking in that wheelhouse, but there are, it's, casino is far, it's like, it's kind of far, yes, it's far, we get that, but it, it does have, it hosts an entire group of, of cycles, we're lucky to have a track, a velodrome, where people can, a banked velodrome, where people can ride, and people do, it as most a, a strong culture. Um, we also have Randall's Islands, kind of like, been blowing up lately, where they do cross and stuff like that. And if we're going to include everybody and be really egalitarian, then we have the, the Bronx kids. Now, if we're really sticking to just the five boroughs, we're, or let's be real, the four boroughs, Staten Island, you just, you're the redhead. <laughs> you're now. Oh, um, Pete Davidson just started crying. Uh, he's going to have to cry. He, he's the first one to say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would go with, I honestly, I want to, Manhattan's best for commuting, the Bronx is still, so. If you actually want to work out and like, and they have Van Portland, which takes you, you know, you don't have to cross any bridges. So really, ugh, I hate to admit it, but the Bronx. As a Brooklyn person, I hate to admit. I know he's making a face. It's so it's it's still, it's because it's the park is still better. It's you're riding on roads though. And the Bronx, yeah, yes, you're riding on the road, like an like an cars. adult, like an adult. Yes, that is correct with cars. That's not um, ideal. It's not. No, I mean there is no. I look. It's not a magical situation, but you can go. Van Portland um, stretches all the way up to what Gold Spring or something like that. If you just look the part yeah, of the path starts there. I like that you said like an adult because the the two other hosts always chirp me for uh, my reluctance to get out there on on busy roads. They're a little bit more intrepid than i am so i yeah i would definitely go for the park i mean we ride i ride through times square every day to get to the park 
it's not like, you know, it's something that we have to do. I'm not, I'm not against it, but I wouldn't call it my dream scenario. I started out as a shameful commuter. So I was used to ride, like I enjoyed getting that easy draft. I didn't have draft of people to draft. I had cars. So, you know, and it's traffic being what it is, they're sitting at 2025, so you just sit in and get where you need to get to in a, in a fast fashion. And again, elevation is everything. Like, I cannot stand, like, Brooklyn's flat. Um, we have the beach, and it's great, and it's beautiful, and, it, you know, but it's flat. So if you want any kind of inclination, you're going uptown in Manhattan, or you're going across the end. All right, next rapid fire question. This is the eternal debate. White or black shoes? White. White shoes. Alex? Yeah. <laughs> Are we do are we agreeing on this? White. Next question. <laughs> All right. Look, I'm I'm team white shoes as well. Just checking if there's a different opinion there. Um, okay. So you're both New Yorkers. Mets or Yankees? Rooting for the Yankees is like rooting for Google or Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, we don't root for Big Brother like that. I don't know. Like, we don't root for the evil empire. They're literally the evil empire. Thank you. I'm a Red Sox. I'm a big Red Sox fan, and these two guys are Blue Jays fans. Yeah. So AL East, would, the yeah. Yankees are our our, our enemies. The only thing we hate the Red Sox too as Blue Jays fans because it's you know those two always keep us down in third or fourth or sometimes fifth place. But uh, as as the, the thing Alex uh, Warren and I can agree on with the AL East is that the Yankees are really the problem. <laughs> so uh, if, he, if anyone out in uh, Tampa Bay or well, Tampa Bay doesn't have any fans, but Baltimore, they'll understand too. The Yankees are the problem of the AL East. Last question. While you're here, this is your opportunity to throw something in the canal. Or I think earlier on the podcast, as New Yorkers, you mentioned, throw it in the East River. I think that's the New York version of throwing something in the canal. So is there anything you'd like to throw in the canal or in the East River? Right. We have in New York, we have Canal Street, but you really wouldn't want to throw anything on Canal Street. <laughs> So we do we dispose of all kinds of things in the East River though. Hint hint. Um knee warmers, I already said that. God. Burn them. Oh, call sorry. It, calling <laughs> cyclists bikers. Yes, thank you. I hate that. Yeah. We're yeah. not we're not out there on a motorcycle that then we're not Hell's Angels or anything <laughs> like that. I agree. It's it's a weird uh weird thing to say. Exactly. Um, it's, it's, it speaks to a filthy casual when I hear somebody say, oh, you're a biker. Um, not waving back. Waving. You're too pro to wave? Who do you think you are? Are you dying? Are you suffering? Even if you're suffering, you've got to give that suffer face of like, I, I know you're in pain. I can see that you're, I'm going down and you're coming up. So I know that you're suffering. Um, but you just nod and you're you brothers and sisters in the suffering. And that's okay. I actually think waving is very pro because there's a certain nonchalance to waving where it's like, oh, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm just pushing 350 watts here, casual. Hey, how you doing? I think it's extremely pro to wave. I agree. That was actually a huge debate Warren and I had with our sort of the group we ride with here in Toronto, uh, because obviously I'm sure you guys have seen it in New York as well. The last, since the pandemic, you know, that we can see just with the numbers and sales, cycling has, has, has blossomed. It's boomed. There, there's been a lot of new riders. And so I was, I felt I was noticing a lot less waving and it, it wasn't clear to me whether it was due to new riders who didn't know the etiquette, just Toronto's full of assholes. <laughs> um, so I, I like, like, I agree. I, I was a big, I'm a big proponent of waving. Like I, even, if, even if it's just kind of like a finger off the, like your, your, your heart or it's a rough patch, it's just like a finger off of your bars to say like, I acknowledge you. We're both doing this silly sport together. You're going one way. I'm going the other. Yeah, absolutely. Agree. Then I know we're definitely have another, I know I'm putting ankle socks. He doesn't want to put ankle socks. Ankle socks going no, to the no, canal, bro. Canal. Away. Oh, God. Who, to, why? Are we sorry? They've been in the canal for yeah. some time. We've we've thrown them there. We threw them in there, but now they're in the East River. Now they're now they're uh, yeah, they're international. Yeah, they're they're world class now. Still still North American though. Um, and taking the rules seriously was the last one, but we already know that that's it's kind of like you know that's kind of the point of this whole thing, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. We uh, no, we we discussed the rules, but let's not take them too seriously. Well, Aliyah and Alex, thank you very much for your time. It was really a pleasure to have you on Cycling Fashion Week. For all, our, all of our listeners, please go check out Ostroy on Instagram at Ostroy NYC or check out their collections Ostroy.com, and you can read Aliyah Barnswell Aliyah Barnwell's columns at Velo News and also follow her 
at her, I will say, very popular Instagram, at Kit Addiction. And please make sure you check them out. They've been great guests. We're very grateful to have you guys on the podcast. Thank you very much. And we hope to speak to you again soon. Thank you for having us. Thank you. It was fun. Thank you. Take care. Okay, moving on to the next segment, Into the Canal, or given that we have a New York heavy episode, Into the East River, maybe? Nah, let's stick to the canal. The time when we throw products, things, ideas from the world of cycling and cycling fashion that we absolutely hate, and we throw them in Montreal's Lachine Canal. Let's start with Warren this week. What do you got, Warren? What I'm going to throw in the canal this week is, I know, I feel like, been harping a lot on this not just me but all of us lately and ripping on big gravel and how it's a front for big mountain bike but i saw a video by cycling tips recently on their youtube channel that uh was about foam tire inserts for gravel bike and they said it was the best upgrade you could make to your gravel bike now i want to first caveat that i like cycling tips a lot i am a paying velo club member their news coverage is great their reviews are often super informative and detailed but are actually podcasts are second only second to this one yeah exactly um they're like reviews are really good to read it's not like reading a textbook on dc rainmaker and all that but you still get all the details you want anyway they had a video up and uh james wong and kaylee frets and uh another contributor were all agreeing that foam inserts for were the best upgrade you can make to your gravel bike. And the reasoning was um, you can't fit mountain bike size tires on your gravel bike. So these kind of give you more, allow you to kind of take on more burly terrain with the foam inserts. They did acknowledge that these foam inserts are hard to get in, uh, though apparently easier than the ones they make for mountain bikes. They also acknowledge they're really expensive. And if, if you do flat, they can be hard to change trail side or on the road. But they, they said it essentially like gives you more grip and makes your tires grippier, blah, blah, blah. Essentially, it just the way they described it sounds like it made you be able to ride more mountain bike stuff. And again, it's the same point. Keep coming back to just get a mountain bike. Yeah, I was going to say, like, you just, we've said this before. I think we've had other, like, gravel bikes on or news kits. And you're just like, okay, like, there's a certain point where, you know, Alex and I, and more to extent, but he likes the cargo bibs a little more than us. Like, <laughs> gravel cycling is great, but it's an extension of your road cycling. It's just sort of like taking, like, a little bit bigger tires, maybe a little bit of, a bit of sort of tread on there off to, like, a little bit of sort of rough terrain. If you're saying, like, oh, I can't get gnarly enough terrain. Do they use the word gnarly? Um, then yeah, then if you can't, then it's not a gravel ride. It's a mountain bike ride Buy a mountain bike. Like, uh, like just, just, just admit, admit that you want to be a mountain biker, get some baggies and buy a mountain bike. I hate gravel events that have single track in them. I, I look at the parcours ahead of signing up for the event. And if it's got any single track could be 10 meters of single track. I'm out. The funny part was in the video, they clarified that they really like, the, the foam inserts apparently really excel in like really rocky gravel, which again, Great. sounds like a mountain, bike. Ma- mountain yeah. bike territory. So yeah, I, I feel like I've listed off all the many reasons. It's just yet another product that big mountain bike is trying to convince you, you need for your gravel bike. Just shoving mountain bikes down our throats. Yeah. But calling it gravel. Mountain bike by any other name. Okay. Tony, what do you got in the canal this week? I am actually doing a reverse canal. I'm giving a you know, recommendation. Pull something from the canal. I'm gonna, well, no, I guess it's not a reverse canal in that sense, but like I'm, I'm giving a recommendation. I'm giving out something positive to the so world. So I think we could call this a camille, maybe, because the canal is when it's not good. The shitty and, part of Montreal riding, and, and the camille is when it's really good for for our international listeners. Camille Oud is the the climb in Montreal. If you watch the Grand Prix Cycliste de Montréal, I think they climb it like 19 times. It's the hardest cut in the world. It is the <laughs> steepest, longest climb in the world. The Stelvio is nothing compared to that. So just check it out on Strava. Camilleud is the best call in the world. All right, so we're gonna. I'm gonna do. We're gonna. I'm gonna do the first Camilleud, and I'm gonna recommend uh, a book called The Rider by Dutch author Tim Crabbe. 
Um, I read this right when I got into cycling about 15 years ago. It's a short little book about sort of the inner workings of being in a cycling race. It's quick. It's, it's written really well. It's something that sort of like gives a lot of motivation and inspires cycling. It was written sometime in the late seventies. Uh, I haven't read it, read it for 15 years. So there's a bit of, uh, you know, uh, memory fog in terms of all the aspects, but I remember really liking it. And really, as a new cyclist, it was really important to kind of helping me understand uh, bikes and bike racing and the mentality of suffering uh, and a lot of the stuff that kind of comes with falling in love with cycling. So in the in the podcast, First Chameleon, I am going to recommend The Rider by Tim Crabbe. I think everyone should uh, go grab it. I read it for the first time a year or two ago, and I, I would agree with Tony. It's a really good book, quick read, and it, it will only just make you want to ride your your bike more okay so i'm gonna do my canal uh okay so the so we're all excited so the world tour is coming back soon so we're recording this podcast in late february um, with late february comes the return of pro cycling there is the umlu pet newsblad on february 26th and the iconic strade bianche in tuscany which arguably some people could say it's a gravel ride. Not really. It's it's a road ride that goes on some 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 gravel sectors. Uh, that's on March fifth, and then you've got all your regular classics that show up after that. Milano Sanremo at the end of March, and then all the Flanders classics after. I'm gonna throw in the canal any race that takes place before Umloop Het Newsblad on February 26, and any race that takes place after the Giro di Lombardia on October 8th, the Tour of Lombardy. And these races that I'm going to throw in the canal are the UAE Tour and the Tour of Guangxi in China. UAE Tour, I have absolutely no interest in watching pro cycling on an eight-lane UAE highway in the desert with ridiculous crosswinds and sand flying all over the place. I don't even know why. They, well, it's clear why they're doing that. I guess there's a market there. That, that pro cycling is trying to attack and it makes a lot of sense from a commercial standpoint. But from a from a pure sports standpoint, this is this is no interest in watching that. I think that these races should be thrown in the canal. Same thing for the tour of Guangxi in China in uh, October. I think it's from October 13 to October 18. China is obviously a big market. Pro cycling wants to get into it. I have no interest in that stuff. These races are absolutely in the canal. I'm going to disagree with you, Alex, specifically about the UAE tour. Morality aside, I think it's actually like a fun race and it kind of gets me back into like it, the excitement of watching bike racing. Like it's a lot of sprint finishes usually and, you know, sprinters are showing up uh, in early season form. Cavendish just won, I think it was stage two with a like really Im impressive win actually, which is like creating potentially maybe a bit of drama around the tour like is it going to be jacobson or is it going to be cavendish that quick step takes or and i can assure you that no decisions in terms of who will be the lead sprinter in quick step are made at the uae tour it is like watching preseason baseball it's like watching the your your stupid toronto blue jays play in florida in the month of March, there is no interest in watching that. I disagree. It's building narratives and storylines that the media can talk about for the next, what, five months. Today, we're recording it on, I believe today was stage four, and there was a mountaintop finish um, that Pogacar won, of course. Yeah, I don't know. I, I The UAE Tour, I actually, I think I started watching it last year and got kind of into it. And so, yeah, I, I disagree. Yeah, Warren, you're incredibly wrong. This is ridiculous. <laughs> Um, because not only is it not interesting as a race, I need my cycling weather trajectory to stay the same with my personal weather trajectory. So like, I don't need to watch the, a sunny, hot UAE knowing that the first time I step out on the road, you know, post trainer sort of early spring will be wet and shitty. So I need like Belgian ride, rides, right? Like I need to, I need to sort of like, I need my, my racing to sort of like follow what my real life weather cycling will be, right? Like tour is perfect because Toronto in July is hot and sticky and, and uncomfortable. And so it's like perfect to watch the tour. So it's like, I can't start with the UAE. I can't watch the UAE tour 
to get excited. Same goes for the tour down under in Australia, which I yeah. think is like in January or something like that, which is almost more like a promotional criterium that riders do. Like no one really takes that seriously, but it's the same thing. You're, you're in six feet of snow. It's minus 20 and you're watching summer in Australia. It just doesn't sound right. It's like a winter vacation for my brain. No, I don't need that. Okay, that's it for this week's episode of Cycling Fashion Week. Thank you very much to Aaliyah Barnwell, the kit critic for Villa News. Follow her on Instagram at Kit Addiction. And thank you very much to Alex Ostroy, the founder and owner of Kid Brand Ostroy. Follow them on Instagram at Ostroy NYC or go to their website, Ostroy.com. Cycling Fashion Week was brought to you by our good friends at Le Club, which is the host to the world's most exciting cycling brands. Go to leclub.cc. They are your go-to destination for the season's premium cycling apparel. They are relaunching their website this spring. They have more brands and categories arriving very soon. But for now, you can find brands like Map, The Service Course, Alba Optics, and Fingers Crossed socks demand more from your cycling experience go to theclub.cc thank you warren thank you tony please follow us on instagram at cycling fashion week you can find the podcast on spotify and apple Podcasts. if you listen to us on apple Podcasts, please leave a review hopefully a five-star review and you can leave a little comment a little funny comment that we have actually a lot of fun reading thank you very much to all of our listeners and we will see you in a couple of weeks for another episode of cycling fashion week Take care.